Um, hi, I'm Richard. I'm from Darwin, and the university up there is called Charles Darwin University. Um, I'm currently doing my double bachelor of IT and new media design. I would say I'm in my fourth year, but uh, I keep having to pull out of units due to conflicts and stuff like that. So it's gone probably longer than four years, even though it's what it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, so. Um, just a, a quick note, um, as I asked this then, is that this is for web developers, so um, if you're not doing web development, it probably won't be that useful to you, um, unless of course, and, and I will be talking, um, I will be making assumptions on web experience, but if there's anything you don't understand, just ask me at the end, and I'll try and give you a summary. Um, also, if, if it restarts, um, my Mac has some graphical issues, and it's, um, kind of expensive to replace it, so, um, and I would have replaced it, but Apple hasn't released any new devices yet, and I don't want to commit like technical suicide by buying something and then they release something next month, so. If it does, I have recorded it and I will make every effort to re redo it a lot, so, but that, just keep that in mind. Um, so, overview is, um, I want to be talking about responsive layouts with a focus on bootstrap. Um, and with, along with that, dynamic style sheets using less as the um, uh, language of choice. Uh, I'll sort of go a little bit in depth later. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about um, components that are initiated through JavaScript um, with a focus on using the data, HTML5 data attributes to activate them as opposed to um, specific uh, JavaScript code to initialize them for um, each site. I'll we'll explain that a bit more later as well. And then finally, I'm going to look at a, 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 a hybrid project I did um, through FrameGap. So it was a, a full uh, web, web app designed in HTML5 and then compiled and then run through FrameGap onto the iOS. Um, so yeah, responsive layouts, um, quick definition. They, they resize based upon um, the screen size through media queries. Uh, can be a lot of work to sort of um, do that. Uh, but thankfully, we have these... Um, things called frameworks that do it all for us most of the time. Um, generally, the content is only written once, and um, it follows a grid system, so uh, you can write a single site and it should work across multiple, provided you've done it right. Um, that doesn't always apply for every single website, like it's a case-by-case -case basis, but generally you should be trying to aim that you write it once, it works everywhere, because that's what the web is supposed to be all about. Um, and one of the cool things with um, frameworks is that you can um, hide and show elements based upon the, the, screen res uh, the screen size. So for instance, you might have an element which is specific for desktop, and then you just hide it when it's on mobile devices, or vice versa. Um, and yeah, frameworks make that the whole process really, really easy, and almost don't have to think about it. So um, it, at Create World, I sort of did a talk on this sort of stuff, but I just sort of glazed over it because I wasn't sure if I was going to get very many techie people, but I'm assuming we've got some more techie people here. So um, what I did is I saw the um, AC website and decided, hey, I might make that responsive just for fun. So that's what it, well, they've changed some of the colors, but that's basically what it looks like. If you resize it, it doesn't um, respond to, um, or at least I don't think it is. I mean, I, I think I opened it on my iPhone, it was all nice little tiny text, so uh, yeah. Did a quick do up, took about 10 minutes to do. Um, obviously, they've got a CMS or something like that to manage all the content. This is a straight um, static page, but the, as far as the layout goes, it really wasn't that hard to make it responsive. And as you'll see, um, already there's a bit of responsiveness happening without any real effort. It was just putting in the correct structure, and um, suddenly we, we've done a, what, what would be you know, three separate projects, you know, tablet phones, desktop, with just a little bit of um, effort and frameworks. Um, I'll note that this is just like a real quick basic, like you'll notice there's some padding issues and that, like I haven't bothered with any sort of tweaking, it's just quick slap bang, um, just so you can see a uh, quick uh, comparison. Another thing you note is, for instance, is that the menus now are pull out menu, so instead of being a, a drop down menu, it then becomes like a uh, indented list. Um, that's like the default bootstrap thing, I don't like it, but that's what my boss likes, so that's the sort of one we use at the moment. Um, I will show a site later which I'll, we're actually trying to sort of make it more like an iOS sort of um, menu, um, but that's later. So frameworks, they obviously do the most of the work for you. Um, 
two major ones are Bootstrap and Foundations. Um, Foundations is obviously aimed more towards mobile devices, uh, whereas Bootstrap is, is takes what I like is we're trying to make our website that works across all platforms, or at least try to anyway. Um, it's, uh, oh yeah, sorry, and there's also JavaScript ones such as jQuery Mobile and Accenture. Um, each thing has their pros and cons. Um, I preferably like to stay away from JavaScript based ones because you write in content in code and I think that's wrong. Keep it at that. Um, so they the updated frequently because most of them are open source. Uh, Accenture I think is paid at least for the app I think, but I think you can actually code. Is it? Yeah, there's, there's some sort of payment involved, whereas everything else there, I'm pretty sure there's no payment involved um, as far as, so like you can get access to them without any issues. Um, they're customizable, and I'll sort of show you um, what I mean by that. Um, yeah, okay, so moving on. So dynamic style sheets, um, they bring code like functionality to CSS. So before, um, say for instance, you had a color, you can't set a variable somewhere and then pass it all the way through, you have to set the color for every single instance in normal CSS. But with um, dynamic, you can set a variable at the top and then reference the variable. So when you want to go back and change it, it's one spot change. Um, uh, sorry if, if people already know this, I'm just sort of making sure I cover all the spots. Um, so yeah, obviously reduces repetition, a lot easier to maintain, and it makes things like where you're having to deal with vendor specific um, code uh, very easy because you can just call a mix in and which is the uh, less version of a function to uh, output the code for you. So it's it's really, really good. And why you needed a compiler to compile the, the CSS, um, I, as my boss informed me uh, the other week, is that some CMSs actually, um, some CMSs actually compile it automatically when you upload it to the server. So it will find the, let, uh, the less file, compile it, and then output a, a compressed, or because you can minify your, your styles and all that. But the um, compiler I use is CodeKit, so um, it not only does CSS, but it does a whole bunch of other languages, including um, JavaScript, and the thing I like with that is that you can then modulize your code, so if you've got a specific component, you can keep it in a separate file and then it's import it into a, like a global file um, at the end. And CSS is quite powerful. Um, I, I, I sort of say that you can pretty much achieve anything that you could in Flash with CSS alone now, these days. Um, with give or take, depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples later as well. Like I've got one particular one. Um, so this is some sample lists. So on the left is the list file and on the right is the, um, the compressed CSS file. As you see, I've created some variables for some settings, so, so colors, uh, radius. You can basically store anything you would on the um, right-hand side of a, a, a list a property, oh, sorry, a CSS property. Um, and then pass that through. So it, one example there is, if you see down the bottom, is uh, I'm calling a mix-in on the ankle link border radius. It outputs all those mix-ins, uh, sorry, all, all those vendor-specific things and then passes through. So instead of having to write four lines of code every time, you reference it once. And that way if there's any changes, for instance, in the way that they do their um, border radiuses, which hopefully they don't, um, you just make that change there and it'll work through the rest of your site. Um, uh, oh yeah, and you can also minify it with um, your your compiler. So like this, this is unminified just so you can read it. But uh, and you can also import stuff as well. So like you don't have to don't have to keep all of this in the one file. You can actually keep it separate and then import it all into a single file, um, which reduces the number of requests on the server. Um, so with with frameworks, um, first thing you probably want to do once you've actually got the hang of it is customize it because um, the Bootstrap framework by itself, uh, although the, the 3.0 is, is starting to look a lot more like iOS and Windows Phone, it's still, you know, like, it's very much a Bootstrap sort of look, and often clients, they want a site very specific to how they want, to, want it to look, and um, normally what you try to do is then try and um, write, like, styles on top, which is, like, I suppose, in my, my, my opinion, it's like you're trying to hack it because you, you're having a override stuff without sort of properly um, incorporating the way that they were um, styled up. So like for instance, uh, a button has all these other states as well. And, and so you get, get like the basic states, you know, off, hover, and then suddenly it changes color when it's a link or something, uh, when it's a use link because you didn't account for that um, when, when you override your styles. 
Whereas um, doing it through um, overrides in the less files, because um, Bootstrap, for instance, is um, uh, the source files is less, uh, it'll pass through all the way through. So um, that way, say for instance, you want to change the color, something real simple, all the way through, and that way uh, you don't have to worry about it um, uh, missing any anything because the uh, source files handles that for you. Um, and I'll let, I'm sort of not sure about the cause, but I'm just going to call it the bootstrap sandwich. So yeah. Um, so this is um, the source files for bootstrap. As you can see, there's a lot of less files, so they've broken up into separate modules. Um, the one I've highlighted there is the main one, so that's the file which it then compiles into your, your final um, bootstrap um, CSS, and then what that does is it imports all the others. Uh, there's uh, so that that's the sort of structure, and I'll just sort of point out. So the first one, um, bootstrap before these three files are like your your core basic files. So that includes variables, mixins, and I think uh, base styles to reset any browser specific um, uh, settings that they try to you know. So you, you, you uh, yeah. um, and, and then so you, you import them and then you apply your own variables and mixins on top so that way for instance if you wanted to change the default body or text color you'd apply it in there and then import the rest of the bootstrap so that way it, it um, it's like a, a nice override sort of like with classes how you can override methods in that so as opposed to directly going into the bootstrap files and making those changes because say for instance is an update um, you've then got to go through and then um, Take out your code to sort of uh, apply them, uh, apply those changes, and it can get real messy. Whereas through this way, you just replace the bootstrap files and then recompile it, and it's updated with all your stuff still intact. Um, yep. So move. Uh, so that that's just a quick example of the final file you'd have. We'd import each of the separate ones. Um, it does mean there's a few more files you have to handle with, but it, like, it depends how you want to import. Like uh, the other day, I was trying to implement uh, a second theme. So, like when this site um, finishes its uh, active period, it goes into like a corporate state, and uh, we needed to change the theme. So, rather than writing a completely new theme, I just um, rearranged how I was importing it so that I just changed a few colors and because and, and then just hide a few things with some styles, and then that's the entire corporate theme implemented in like two, three hours, as opposed to a completely fresh start. Sort of thing, um, which is what, what I'm trying to get at with these sorts of um, uh, overriding things. Um, so moving on to data, HTML5 data attributes. Uh, so I'm not sure of the true definition, but it's basically you store in data data them elements. It's I suppose sort of self-explanatory. Um, a lot of frameworks actually use them um, to activate components. Uh, so uh, or, or, or at the very least, actually use the data object on elements to uh, store stuff. Um, but it, it's like a, it's a neat way to sort of pass uh, settings to uh, an element without having to write code to implement that. Um, and so Bootstrap in particular, all of its components actually use um, data attributes to implement uh, fully functional um, uh, interfaces, which have no custom JavaScript to get it all working. So you can have a a fully functional uh, prototype, for instance, and you would have written no JavaScript to get it to work. Um, so here's, here's an example of a Bootstrap one. It's a drop-down menu. All it is, it's just a div with a button and then a list of uh, sub-buttons. And then it, it looks for the tags, wraps it in a nice little button, and then you've got a fully activated drop-down menu, as opposed to having to write that, style it. Um, I mean, multiple ways you could do that. Um, and, and also, uh, they're quite reusable. Um, so once you've written a function, you can use it on many other sites. So like, I have, I have like a, a list of little functions I've come up with for specific sites, and then I just reuse them for other ones. Um, so there's a couple of different kinds of functions uh, that I use. One's a wrapper function. So say, for instance, you have input fields. They're not that pretty. You want to wrap them. So you create somewhere. You, you say, OK, this, this, I want to wrap this select. It wraps it in a, in a div, and then you apply your own styles. And so what you're seeing there is just a span sitting inside a, a bordered div. And when the, the function, will, when, when, the, um, when the select field changes, it just copies what the value is and pastes it out in the span. So um, like you're still interacting with the select, but you've completely changed the way it looks. Yep. Yep.
Uh, no, well, so so the, the, the way this one's structure is is that the, sorry, I didn't mean div label. So it's actually wrapped inside a label. Oh, yeah, sorry, I, I'm automatically thinking div, so because that's the default <laughs> element. Yeah. Uh, these, these two snippets, um, does it also break the Um. I suppose it sort of depends what you're trying to use. So like um, that one, for instance, it's just it's a label. I'm pretty sure you can have spans inside labels. I don't think there's a restriction on those ones. HTML5 is a bit more tolerant with a lot of lot of semantics. So, um, but th this is sort of like how I've seen um, a lot of frameworks use it. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm well aware. I've had teachers tell me all about this sort of stuff. But it's like you've you've got to do something like like for instance select fields. I think they change quite a bit between different browsers, and if you want a consistent look, you've got to do something. So, yeah. um, but the key thing is because it's still based upon the select element. Se select element's still there. It's still actually been interacted with. I'm not actually. It's just sitting there invisible on top, um, and so uh, it, it's it's still degrading to uh, like the normal uh, uh, to to the normal uh, form functionality, as opposed to uh, some sites where if you actually look, they have like divs, like all all the interactions are straight divs or like there's no no form elements anymore. Like they've lost that sort of um, interaction. Um, the rating's a little bit a little bit different though. Like uh, so, like I think Chrome does it just does it as a range. It actually implements a range. But what this one does is it wraps wraps it in a, in a div um, and then has uh, it's actually using a CSV trick where uh, using like a right to left. So that way um, I've got a live example of this. That you can actually do like a full animate like. As you move over, it highlights the next stars and that. So, uh, I'll, I'll show it later if I've got time. Sort of speed through it. Um, so yeah, but it, the idea I'm just saying is that as far as implementing this um, uh, JavaScript on top, you just add in a, a, a data attribute to sort of uh, identify it rather than write in code. Okay, fine. Uh, input with the name rating. Apply this to it. So it's all automated upon page load. Well, I think the like, I'm I'm not like a big research sort of person, but I think the argument with it is that classes are supposed to like be like style, or, or uh, whereas um, if if you just throw every little bit of information into the class, then you've got like um, like this is a, a something I've actually done in another a project where um, I've just like added the like, category, so like you've got elements and you you, you, know, you hide them based upon their category or something, and so I've added the class category and all this sort of stuff, but. Sometimes, for instance, you want to preserve that information. So, like for instance, you got a value. You can't actually store a class as a as a, a numerical value. So, you want to store it as a data attribute. So, and that's the key thing is that the other cool thing with data attribute, particularly with jQuery, is to get all those data attributes. You just go, you know, select this element dot data, and it creates a JSON object. So, that's the other cool thing about it is that it, it's very quick to interchange it in and out. So, whereas classes, you have to find the correct class, see if it matches, and then filter out, for instance, if you're doing something like category dash one, to get the category ID, you've got to do a string match and all that sort of stuff. So, it, I don't know, it, I'm, I'm not probably gonna get to the semantics of it because I'm just trying to sort of show ways of um, making it easier to do this sort of stuff. But I, I, I'm not in an argument because I've got to teach that it's all really into all that sort of stuff. But. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, some other ones are trigger actions. So um, there is a component already in Bootstrap called Alert. It what it is is it's like a uh, you know your messages. It looks like a message um, on your iMessages. Except it has a little close button. You click close, fades out, disappears. It does the exact same thing except that it's not specific to an alert. So it, as you see, it's got two um, data attributes: action. So I'm saying it's a remove and target. So that way you can. Um, specify whatever target you want using a selector, and then it'll remove it with a nice little fade out. So, um, but obviously you can customize whatever you want. Um, as you can see, this is a quick example of, of how how it gets implemented um, on page load. So normally you'd have like a whole bunch of functions, and you call them all together inside the um, the ready function. 
going to say? No, lost it. Um, anyway, moving on. Uh, and then another one is the YouTube embed. So um, I do a lot of media sites, and they love the YouTube videos. And suddenly, you know, after, after giving them the range to sort of put their content in, suddenly the page is taking like, you know, 10 seconds or so to, it's like, like as it's frozen. And what that is is that once the page loads, it's then got to load each sequential iframe, which creates like a, a delay or something. I don't know if it's it's Acer or whatever, but it's like really bad. And so the solution I went for it is um, I then create a link with the um, the, the URL, uh, YouTube URL, and uh, YouTube actually has a, a URL path for getting the thumbnail. So it's actually got a couple of them. Uh, they've got documentation on it. And so I, I read a function where it takes a, an anchor link, converts it to something that looks like a play button sort of YouTube -y thing. And so when you click on it, then it creates the iframe and then presses play. So that way, you're only loading the iframe when they actually want it, and you're not getting any of that delay sort of lag when it's trying to load all these iframes. Particularly, like for instance, if you've got a blog feed or something, and it's like 10, 10 YouTube videos, the last five blogs, loads all at once, incredibly slow on your, your page. So this, this is, I suppose, where these sorts of things can be really helpful to speed up, particularly with embed stuff, because they're unavoidable as much, much as we'd like to get rid of them, but um, like Twitter and Facebook, but um, yeah. Uh, and the third one is library triggers. So often you have things like Lightbox. Um, has anyone heard of Flex Slider? No. It's a carousel um, library, so it basically creates a carousel um, effect. So often you have like a you, your banner image and it then slides across or tra uh, transitions. So this one's a Flex Slider. It's something we use a lot. Um, it includes two other components: we have directionals and sides, as well as the little um, Apple dots, you know, for between pages. Um, so often, by default, because we have it as a header, we don't want the dots, we don't want the sides. So I create a function, I say generate, um, uh, trigger this library, um, pass in these data attributes, so it'll just pa pass through all those data attributes in through it. And the thing with this particular trigger function is that it's not specific to any library, so it'll check to see if there's a, a, a jQuery, because um, often uh, li libraries are done where it's you know the function and then the, um, the library name, so like to call it, you get selector, flex slide, and then pass in the variables. So, you, so with this, you say specify. Okay, so I'm looking for a, a function called this. See if it exists. Run it and pass these variables through. So that way, it's 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 already able to work for most libraries without any sort of modifications. Um, yeah, and again, so instead of having to write that custom code to to get the flex slider working, I just copy paste this code, change what the actual list elements are, and it's done. So, um, which is really good when you're trying to pump out sites and stuff. Um, uh, so another one, um, has anyone heard of Lightbox? It's like an image view. Uh, we used to use Lightbox, but since we've sort of really taken on the um, responsive design, we found that it's not that responsive, so we're using one called Fancybox, which is, I, I think is actually supposed to be like a spiritual successor, but made by someone else, and it's a lot more responsive. So like if you change, change the orientation and all that, it actually resizes the um, image view to fit the screen and that. So uh, again, um, Lightbox used to actually auto in, uh, Lightbox auto initiate, so like you can actually get it to automate without doing any JavaScript. Um, but Fancybox doesn't, so another one where I had to do like a library call to get it to work. Um, uh, again, I'll show you some examples of these later. So moving on, so my um, first act, this is this is my first app that's actually made it to the App Store, so uh, through through a client. Um, and it's a Darwin Festival app. So up and down um, every August or so, we have uh, so we celebrate like culture and um, arts and all that. So we have performances from actually overseas as well. Like we get all sorts of stuff in there, and everyone loves it. Um, and it was originally going to be an, a native iOS app, but we had a very tight um, time constraint and budget, and I didn't have the uh, confidence in my iOS experience to actually build my first uh, app on the App Store. Uh, you know like that, so I chose to go the hybrid route because uh, I do web all the, all the time, so I thought that'd be much quicker. Um, and so um, I, I used PhoneGap, and I in, instead of uh, doing like static pages, I decided to write a template in Engine. Now, I'll, I'll sort of explain what that is if people don't know what that is, but um, it, uh, oh, sorry, I've got the animations. Uh, yeah, new. Um, yeah, so 
Let's move on to the next one then. Uh, so there were other frameworks considered. At the time, I actually wasn't that familiar with jQuery Mobile because I just thought it was just like some extra styles that you just apply to jQuery that makes it faster or something. And then I did a class and I was like, oh, it's an actual fully, it actually does the same sort of things what I try to do. It's just that it's, it's um, particular theme, it's not really um, updated or customizable. Like you really have to sort of write your own theme for it. And it's sort of stuck in like an iOS 4 sort of look and feel, um, which is quite not very nice. But the thing is, it implements a lot of the gestures really well. So um, it, it'd, be, it'd be cool if you, if you could sort of pull that across, like get the functionality, but not the look. Um, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, and Central was the other option we were looking at. But I, um, from previous experience, I just really did not like doing content in JavaScript. So I really wanted a templating sort of style. And um, oh, so, sort of process, and because I've been because I've been doing a lot of um, uh, CMS base, uh, we we use one called Expression Engine, and they use the Templating Engine, and um, I find it's it's much better than, for instance, jumping in and out of PHP or or I suppose any other form of getting that content into the actual elements. And I'll show you in a minute what I mean. Um, the actual data had to be canned, so because um, last last year's version. It actually relied on web pages, and as soon as you updated the website, the whole app broke. So, um, and I'll just note that I wasn't actually in that development team at the time. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, and so it's, it's, it was all stored as, as one big JSON uh, object. So, um, it's about 100 shows, um, venue information. Uh, the only thing that was actually raw static content was like static info pages, you know, like about us, because there was no logical way to fit that into the object as such. Um, Okay, so um, uh, so yeah, and, and the other thing is that the expression is um, CMS doesn't have an API, so I had to sort of implement that because uh, part of the um, app included like a, a planner, so you'd schedule uh, which shows you wanted to go see, and it'd, it'd give you a list list of when they're on, and, and you know like, and then and it'd sync between devices, uh, and so I had to create the whole login process, and then. And an API to get that all to work. Uh, scrolling was implemented with the web WebKit overflow. Um, so it's like a uh, property. It's really simple. You just apply that, and then as soon as the element's bigger, it then works like a normal uh, flick, and you get the nice uh, bounce at the end as well. So it just behaves like a, a native uh, scroll view. Um, and all transitions were done with CSS3. So I haven't done any JavaScript animation or anything like. That. The only job JavaScript does, or at least this is sort of the, the way I try to do it, is that JavaScript changes class names. That's all it does. So it might take input and then convert that to a class name change. And I'll show you examples of what I mean. Um, and yeah, so going back to that template in, in engine, so um, a bit more details. Expression has their own fra PHP framework, and part of that includes a template parser, which is a template engine. So. Um, so here's an example of um, a, 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 a template. So this is a this is a lot like um, jQuery Mobile in terms of structure. Like I, I didn't see jQuery Mobile before I did this, so you now I can really see the similarities. Um, if you see here, those are um, template variables. So these are what get passed when you put it through the parser. So they're referencing variable that um, you're passing. So pretend you've got a function, right? You you've got a HTML text template and you've got a JSON object with all these variables in it. You send it to the parser and then, then finds all those matches and then applies them. So top one there, straightforward, it's just a variable which would hold the, the image uh, path. And then, then the one down there, you've got an if statement. So it says if there is a description, output the description, otherwise use a, a no description. Um, and then the bottom one there, we've got um, uh, a, an object which has latitude, longitude, so you can do like dots. So, uh, it, it's it's a little, little bit different because um, uh, the uh, expression engine is um, really complicated. Like it actually has like full-on functions. So like when you make modules and stuff, you actually create like a opening and closing tag with all the uh, stuff to do loops. Um, whereas this is just a bit more um, simplified. Uh, and the reason being is that like hundred shows. If I was to do a static page for every one of those, uh, that'd take a while. So whereas I was able to get hundred shows working, um, you know. Uh, uh, once I had the en engine implemented, you know, five minutes to get the whole all the shows working because, um, as you notice there, links have like an action sort of path. So like the first part of the act, 
um, the link is um, the action and then properties follow it. So for instance, uh, shows, so go, go to the shows uh, template, um, uh, venues, so that's actually got, going, going to a um, show uh, with the actual uh, slug. So uh, if you're familiar with um, URL segments at all, so we ha have a, a, a user-friendly URL which re re is readable, so like they can actually read out the path as opposed to um, page slash one sort of thing. It's um, to do with SEO. I'm not that familiar with it, but it's sort of something that uh, we've really tried to enforce. Um, yeah, so here's um, just a few screenshots of what the app looks like. Um, this was done before iOS 7, so there's been no sort of iOS 7 consideration or anything like that, so uh, yeah. Um, and the, the pull-out menu was based upon the Facebook one before they changed it. I sort of don't understand why because I thought the pull-out menu made sense. Now it's like three buttons and then a more with a big list of things. So I don't know. I, I, I liked it. Um, but yeah. Um, and yep. And this a few more slides. So there's, there's a, a view. Um, we included Google Maps through their JavaScript API. So that's actually an... Um, uh, div, it's not, not an embedded one, so it, it actually creates like a, a div structure. And it's, it's not actually that um, customizable because you actually look at it, there's no classes or nothing. The way they implement their maps is horrid. Um, as far as, like, for instance, if you did want to do some, something simple like change the icon, you have to do it through the JavaScript. So, And, and then on the end, we've got the actual planner there, so you can edit and that. And I'll actually uh, show you it. Let's uh, go back. Okay, so this is the app now. Um, there is a bit of lag between up on the screen, but it's actually really fast. So if it's a bit slow, uh, that's the delay. So if you want to see it, it's actually free to download. It's not going to break your phone or anything because it's a hybrid app. Um, uh, yeah, and as it says, like that is just straight LIs, just made to look like elements, and then the scrolling is just, just that WebKit CSS. So. Um, yeah, it's not really hard to do at all. And then with the planner, you specify the date you want to see, add it to your planner. And then we, so, so um, because we're on a tight budget, we didn't get a lot of revision as part of, so I understand if you're spotting any sort of UI issues and that, I'm well aware of them. It's, I, just can't, I wasn't allowed to work on it any more than I already was. So, um, yeah, and as you see, here's the edit menu and you can, Delete them, and this is all synced up with my online account. So, like, because uh, up and down, we're sort of we're not like all like mobile freaks, and most people with mobiles they got Android. So, it's, um, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, that's this sort of is. Um, and moving back, and I need to. Yep. Okay. Continue on. So um, to create a Pranget project, and it's um, pretty simple. They seem to have adopted Node.js, and for those who don't know what Node.js is, it's, um, it's a server-side JavaScript um, framework uh, that does, you program in JavaScript, then it runs it like PHP on the server. Um, and they, they've opted that all their installations done through that, but just to keep it simple, I've gone for a terminal version. So um, yeah, you go there, you down download phone, get uh, one of the archive versions. So there's actually 3.0, but I can't figure out how to download it. So because I'm assuming they're, they're, they're doing that because they want to encourage the Node.js. So open up terminal, um, you specify where, where your path is, and then it's got some subdirectories. So that's where the files are for creating an Xcode project. Um, then you know, I'm sure if you've done Xcode, bundle ID, project name, same thing, and this where we're going to store it. And then it creates this structure. As you can see already, it looks starting to look like an Xcode project. If you run that now, it fully works Xcode project. You can click run, and it runs. Unless, of course, there's any conflicts, but it shouldn't. And if you notice, uh, you've got the www dub file. For those that have used um, MAMP, WAMP servers or anything like that, that's what it's based upon. It's basically, the www was the representation of where all your files are stored. In, in a, so does anyone actually know what a MAMP is? WAMP, MAMP, LAMP? You do? Okay, so uh, it's been able to run uh, server-side code on your local computer. It's really helpful when you want to test stuff and not have to upload it to the server to test it. Um, we use it a lot. Um, 
and yet. But that's where all your HTML content goes into the www file, and as long as it's an index file, it'll just run. So it, it, it's really that simple just to sort of get it up and running onto the, the site. Um, they've got full documentation and all that. You notice there's another one called Cordova. That's what they use to um, interact with the hardware. So that actually gives you full functionality for most of the hardware, like accelerometers. Um, I don't know all the hardware, but um, and yeah, they've, they've, they've got documentation on that. For this app, we didn't actually implement any um, uh, hardware su support, but I think we probably would um, in further revisions. Um, they've also got an iCloud version of, of their or this cloud version of their, their thing where it actually compiles the app for all platforms, like there's the ones they support at the moment. Um, the thing is, is it requires, like, like that they support Git, so like you can actually, if you push your project to Git, then it will download from there and then compile it, but there is a bit of a delay, so if you're trying to do like rapid prototyping, it's not that ideal, because um, it can fail, sometimes it can take a bit of time, so, but if, if for instance, you just want like a quick, um, so say for instance, uh, like Android, uh, I think you can actually part, give them a link and then it'll download the app onto their phone. Um, it can generate them and then you just give like the client the link and then they download them on their phone and it installs it. So it can be useful in that sense for like a quick distribution. Um, uh, but yeah, not really for fast prototyping, but uh, yeah. And I wasn't that good with certificates. I'm probably not so good with certificates now. And um, not getting those right was a real pain because it's like, it won't compile it unless it's got the proper certificate, and even then, it compiles it, it's all correct, download, oh sorry, this isn't a valid on my phone because it's not correct certificates. Um, so reflections on the project, obviously the certificate's the most difficult part I had with it. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, um, the 2012 version, um, it was developed by someone else, and they didn't specify the target device, so when it got put up on this, on, onto the App Store, it actually had iPad support checked off, and like this app has always been iPhone only. And so when I'm there trying to push up my version of it, I couldn't because it um, degrading our functionality and that's not allowed by Apple. So you gotta be real careful when you push up that you make sure if you're only gonna target one device that you specify it and then it's actually clear. Because when you go to make an update the next year and use something different, it's not gonna work. And so we had to create a new project as in a new, new app and then push it up to the store and that new name, like you can't use the same name, so it's a real pain. Um, so yeah, make, make sure they're real clear before you submit it. Uh, future, um, the Darnfest app is um, only current during like about one month of the year, so uh, I'm, I'm not gonna get into the logistics of why I have an app and all that, sort of, I just do my job. But um, yeah, strict budget and time frame, so it's really unlikely I'm gonna get to do any real work on it, even though I really want to, um, until next year. So at best, I might be able to do small bug fixes, but because, uh, yeah, they, they don't, it's not an ongoing like budget funding sort of project, and in fact they probably got a lot a much better app than what you know they should have got. Um, and so what I'd like to do is I'd really like to improve my um, templating engine because uh, as far as output and all the layouts, it was it's it, it's like HTML is really nice and easy. It's it's friendly. Um, you don't even really have to think about it. And as long, long as you understand um, JSON objects, it's it's really quick and easy, so, um, and I want it so I can use it in other apps, so if, if this is another app where a hybrid app is appropriate, I'd, I'd definitely like to use it, as opposed to something like Censure or anything else. Um, but I still want to build up my um, native experience, so that way I've got choices. So rather than saying, oh, one platform's the only way, I can actually say, well, I can do it on Android, I can do it on iOS, and I can do a hybrid, and then figure out which one's the appropriate one for the project, because I don't know if this is an invalid argument, but say for instance you do a native app and all it is is web views, maybe that should be a hybrid app because, um, I don't know, but I'm not that experienced, so, but um, yeah, let's make more apps. Um, so that's my talk.